In part 4 of this presentation, we are going to discuss the effects of the interaction between the aquifers and the Englishman River. We will also illustrate the connections between the land and the aquifers by showing recharge areas. So what do we mean when we say that groundwater and surface water are connected, that it is the same water? What are the regulating effects provided by the aquifers? Volunteers have measured water temperature, electrical conductivity, total dissolved solids, and pH along the river at up to 20 locations during nine monitoring events. This was done throughout the year under both high and low flow conditions. This graph illustrates the variation in water temperature versus distance from the foreshore for these monitoring events. Three key observations can be made based on this graph. First, water is cooler at high altitude. Second, during the winter, water in the river results predominantly from runoff and is cold. In the summer, water is warmer and we observe that in the lower 16 kilometers, the water has a relative constant temperature as shown by a plateau on the graph. This indicates that although water flows slowly and gets warmed up due to exposure to the sun and warm air, it is at the same time cooled by groundwater discharging into the river at a constant temperature of 10 degrees C. This was confirmed by measuring the temperature from the spring at 14.5 kilometers, which was near 10 degrees C, as illustrated by the blue circle. The cooling effect provided by the groundwater flow to the river is very important because fish like cold water, and this is very important for the survival. Rainwater has a low electrical conductivity, typically less than 40 microsiemens. This is reflected by the low values measured in the winter when the river mostly consists of rainwater. In the summer and fall, the electrical conductivity is higher because the groundwater component is greater. This is clearly illustrated by the highest conductivity values between 80 and 100 microsiemens, measured when the flow was the lowest at 1.3 and 1.9 cubic meter per second. The conductivity of the groundwater coming from the spring located at 14.5 kilometers, the spring consisting of 100% groundwater, confirmed the higher conductivity of groundwater around 115 microsiemens. This slide illustrates the close connection between groundwater and surface water. Aquifers provide the groundwater that feeds wetlands and small streams. When water tables drop, the flux of groundwater discharging to these receptors and their fragile ecosystems decreases. Droughts or long periods when aquifers are being mined can therefore result in the drying of wetlands and streams. This is the picture of a big puddle, approximately one meter in diameter. This puddle is not just a puddle. When I walked by it, on July 21st, 2010, at 2.31 in the afternoon, on a sunny day, I observed fry, a dozen of them. They were all concentrated at a specific spot. Why there? 
because it is where groundwater was discharging to this little puddle. They were looking for cooler and fresher water, possibly containing more oxygen than the warm, silty, and algae-rich water of the puddle. Where was that puddle? At the end of a drainage ditch, a plant at the corner of a field. This fry had swum almost two kilometers from the Englishman River, up small tributaries to the local headwaters. I walked by the puddle two hours later. I was very saddened by what I saw. All the fry had died because the water conditions had passed the tipping point that allowed them to survive. The simple experience really confirms to me that what I just showed you is not simply a nice and colorful little cartoon. This is reality. Surface water and groundwater are closely connected. They are one. We have to be very careful with what we do with the land and how it affects water tables. One of the objectives of our project was to delineate the land where aquifers connected to the Englishman River are being recharged. So let's see what these contributing areas look like. We have created these butterfly views for this purpose. We have used the view of both the right bank and the left bank of the river, showing where the aquifers are in contact with the river, and have added the footprint of these aquifers using color coding. For example, on the left bank, we have a shallow aquifer in purple. The purple shaded area shows its footprint. The thick dashed line delineates the boundary of the estimated recharge area. This is the area where precipitation will generate infiltration that will reach the aquifer and will continue its travel as groundwater discharging into the river. On the right bank, the boundary of the recharge area does not correspond to the footprint of the aquifer because there is a divide. Water droplets falling left of the divide will end up in the Englishman River. The ones falling on the right side will end up discharging into the South Englishman River. As we move down the river, we are now between 10 kilometers and 5 kilometers from the foreshore. The sequence of aquifers is more complex. On the left bank, the whole footprint of the upper aquifer, colored in orange, participates to the generation of groundwater discharging into the Englishman River. On the right bank, the aquifers have a large footprint, and only a small portion of them will act as a recharge zone for groundwater discharging to the Englishman River. We are now in the lowest section of the Englishman River, between 5 kilometers from the foreshore and the estuary. On both sides, we show the estimated footprints of the aquifers and their respective recharge zones for which groundwater dischargers to the Englishman River. Beyond the thick dashed lines, groundwater dischargers directly to the ocean. The data loggers also record water temperature. The fluctuation of groundwater temperature versus time is a very useful tool to analyze the recharge of aquifers. A very thin, shallow, unconfined aquifer will see the temperature of its groundwater reflect the fluctuation of the air temperature 
and the temperature of the rainwater that recharges it, as illustrated by the curve for the well at Rastrever Nature House. The highway scale well still shows a seasonal fluctuation, but with a much smaller amplitude of less than a degree C. Other wells, such as the Margaret Well, have a very flat curve, indicative of a large aquifer with a lot of temperature inertia and a longer recharge process where temperature equilibrium is reached. Here I would like to draw your attention on the groundwater temperature measured in two wells. The Island Timberland West Bay Road well, which is a deep well completed in the lower confined sand and gravel aquifer at 74 meters below ground. It indicates a relatively constant temperature with no obvious seasonal fluctuations and a slight cooling trend of 0.2 degrees C per year. Interestingly, it shows the same trend as observed in the Martindale well, which is completed in bedrock at 85 meters. This would indicate that the deep sand and gravel aquifer is likely recharged through the bedrock. I had mentioned in part two the odd behavior of the island Timberland West Bay Road well with large fluctuations of the water table even at four o'clock in the morning when I expected the water level to have recovered from any daytime pumping. So I looked at the results in more details focusing on the first week of July including days when activities were supposed to be reduced to a minimum during the Canada Day long weekend. As you can see, on Tuesday, July the 5th, when work resumed, the water level dropped significantly at the end of the day. The same thing happened on the following Wednesday and Friday. Why is this happening? I called Highland Timberland and got the explanation. At the end of the day, the trucks return to the yard and they are washed. This sudden and intense use of the well at the end of the day produces the large observed drawdown. But what really caught my attention in this graph is the groundwater temperature. When the well is pumping hard, resulting in the biggest throwdown, we observe a sudden drop of the water temperature, not by much, but recorded by the data logger. I believe this is water coming through the bedrock and slightly cooler because it originates from higher altitude where the average air temperature is much colder and recharge partly results from snow melt. Unfortunately, I was limited by time and budget in reviewing the groundwater temperature data, but I believe this represents a wealth of information worth digging through to better understand the behavior of our aquifers.